So for those uh, that didn't attend the first one, let me just quickly recap. So in the first session, we looked at personality, understanding yourself, because to be a good trader, you have to understand those aspects of yourselves, your limitations, your strengths, your weaknesses, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They lay the foundations for all the other aspects um, that I'll be talking about in the rest of this series that make a good trader, such as uh, foresight ability, practical intelligence, emotional intelligence, and things like that. Uh, so that's where the first one and the second one, which we're doing today, is where we start to finish off the rest of the stuff around personality and understanding yourself. So first one, we spoke briefly about the different types of uh, personality frameworks. There's some good ones. There's some bad ones, of course. Let me just post a picture up here to show you the one that we'll be uh, adopting. So if you check the PGVC chat, I've just put up an illustration there of what we refer to as the big five, which is our most accurate representation that we have at this particular moment in time that best describes who we are, uh, the personality composition and all those things that, that make us feel, think and behave the way that we do. And it's all comprised around these five uh, broad dimensions of personality. I'm not, that's not, uh, not to say that maybe in 10 or 20 years time, we might have a different idea of that, but this model's been, it was first introduced into, in the early eighties and it's been the most prominent, most accurate, uh, descriptor and framework that we've had since then. So it stood the test of time. There's been a lot of skeptics and it, and it keeps creeping up as the most, uh, valued and, and it generates the most consensus in the literature. So that this is what we have at, at this present time. So basically what you see there is five broad traits. We've got conscientiousness, openness, extroversion, neuroticism and agreeableness. And then under each of those five broad dimensions, we have our sub traits or our sub facets. And those facets are the traits that make up the the broad dimension so you can think of personality as as hierarchical in nature like the uh, underground root system of a tree it all stems from the trunk and then it br keeps branching out as you move down through the hierarchy so underneath each of those sub facets are even smaller traits and and composites um, so it goes on and on for about five or six levels. And the, and the longer, uh, the more you dive deeper into our personality down the hierarchy, the more uh, the genetic contribution, let's say, to those particular sub-traits get larger and larger. And they're more difficult to, to obviously develop and change because they're deeply rooted in biology. But the ones you're looking at here, we do have... Uh, facilities to uh, improve these things or increase or decrease them. So we've come a fair way with with our personality, uh, the understandings that we have around personality um, since its inception. We spoke about nature versus nurture surrounding personality, and we know that roughly speaking, about 40 to 50 percent is contributed to our genetics for so the stuff that we're born with that uh, remains pretty stable over our lifespan and then the remaining is all uh, based on those environmental factors so the schools we go to the people we hang out with the jobs we take uh, belief systems religions all that kind of stuff influences and shapes the type of people we we are and how we develop with those particular traits over the lifetime um, in the first session, we specifically tackled uh, the trait dimension conscientiousness because it correlates the, uh, the strongest across trading psychology variables. So things such as order, uh, rule abiding, achievement striving, impulse control, delay of gratification, responsibility, uh, they're all vital to becoming a, a solid trader uh, so if you did miss the first session uh, it's probably worthwhile that you spend some time going back over it 
because we tackle a lot of those important elements regarding personality and trading psychology in that first one. But what we're going to do now is actually finish off the rest, the other four remaining components, and link it to trading psychology and see where the value can be created from, from those aspects. Uh, also, I'd like to mention that uh, we also... Well, I provided everyone with the IPIP test, which is the personality test for the big five. So if you haven't done that and you missed it the first time, I've provided the link there for you in the chat. Um, do the second link, the one at the bottom, it's 120 items. It's, it's better than doing the 300 items, which takes a lot longer. But if you need help finding that later, let me know and I can, um, we can have a look at that maybe at the end of the seminar. So we're going to, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, we're going to start looking now at extroversion, neuroticism, openness, and agreeableness. And they still have their place when discussing trading psychology. So let's take a few minutes to unpack each of those in terms of their definitions. So first we have extroversion easily uh, identifiable, widely recognizable as someone who gets energized in the company of others. This amongst the other traits which include talkativeness, assertiveness, and high amounts of emotional expressiveness. Um, and it's for these reasons it's made those extroverted people widely recognizable because they're the ones that tend to stick out the most in those uh, social uh, situations and interactions. I'm sure we all have one friend or a family member or something like that who aren't exactly wallflowers with regards to social interaction. They thrive on being um, the lack of centre of attention, what we refer to as the polar opposite of extroversion, which is neuroticism. So think of those two continuum. So at one end you have highly extroverted people, at the other end you have highly introverted all the way along that in the middle you have everyone else essentially plotted along uh, that continuum. And it's not like you either have it or you don't. It's not a category per se. It's a continuum. So we all have some form of introversion and some form of extroversion. It's just, it, it varies depending on um, those genetic aspects and also those environmental factors. So the opposite to extroversion, like I was saying, of course, is the introversion. They prefer solitude. They have less energy in social situations. Being at the center of attention or making small talk can be quite taxing for these individuals. Uh, extroverts tend to have very public facing roles, including uh, areas such as sales, marketing, sometimes teaching and politics. They're often seen as leaders. Uh, extroverted people are more likely to lead than stand in the crowd. and um, be seen to not be doing anything essentially. Uh, we'll just get the definitions done first and then we'll look at the, the trading outcomes for them. The next one's neuroticism. So this is characterized by sadness, moodiness, emotional instability. It's often mistaken for antisocial behavior uh, or worse, those greater psychological issues, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, it's a bit of a misunderstanding there that many people have. But neuroticism is uh, it's a, figure, it's a physical and emotional response to stress and perceived threat in someone's daily life, essentially. So individuals who exhibit high levels of neuroticism tend to experience mood swings, anxiety, irritability. And even some individuals who experience sudden changes in character from day to day uh, are often considered to be highly neurotic. Uh, as they tend to respond to high stress uh, levels in their work and personal lives, it's, they're quite sensitive to it. Uh, anxiety, which plays a large part in the makeup of neuroticism, is about obviously that individual's ability to cope with stress and perceived or actual risk. Uh, so in trading situations, not the greatest trait to have if you have high levels of neuroticism, particularly in Web3 because it's so volatile and so dynamic, it's constantly moving. It can be very stressful to deal with. So people who tend to lean naturally to neuroticism, they tend to not do so well in these types of trading environments. 
Uh, people who suffer with neuroticism uh, will often overthink of a lot of uh, over uh, overthink a lot of situations and find difficulty in relaxing, even when they're by themselves, kind of in their own space. And of course, those who rank lower on neuroticism will exhibit a more stable and a more emotionally resilient attitude to stress and situations. Uh, low neurotic individuals also rarely feel sad or depressed because uh, they take the time to focus on the present moment and they often do not get involved too much in mental arithmetic or, uh, or delve uh, on possible stress-inducing factors. Next, we have openness. It's a characteristic that includes things like imagination, creativity, insight the world other people and an eagerness to learn and experience new things is particularly high for this personality trait it leads to having a broad range of interests and being more adventurous when it comes to decision making so there's outcomes and implications there for the trading uh, for the trader so to speak which we'll get to uh, later on uh, creativity also plays a big part in the openness trait, as I mentioned before. This leads to a greater comfort zone when it comes to abstract and uh, lateral thinking. So think of that person who's always ordering the most exotic thing on the menu, going to different places and having interests which you if you don't have this trait at the high level, may not naturally think of. So that is someone who has high in openness, generally speaking. So anyone low in this trait tends to be viewed with more traditional approaches to life, and sometimes they might struggle when it comes to problem solving outside their own comfort zone or when they're operating outside their own skill sets or knowledge or abilities and things like that. Again, there's implications there for trading because people tend to stick to their own lanes um, in that sense, where the more the people that load higher into openness, for example, would be more likely, let's say, as an example, to do that degen mint. Um, it'd be in actually interesting to measure, say, creativity in the Web3 space or openness, and then... Uh, their bags, people's bags, have a look at their hidden files and see how much DGEN stuff is in there. I think there would be some interesting correlations with that. Um, lastly, we have uh, agreeableness. So people who exhibit uh, high agreeableness often show signs of trust. Um, they're altruistic, uh, meaning they like to do good things for, for other people. Um, they tend to be quite kind and they show a lot of affection. Um, highly agreeable people tend to have high pro-social behaviours, which means that they're more inclined to be helping other people. So people that often work in not-for-profit sectors and things like that tend to have uh, high agreeableness. Um, sharing, comforting and cooperation are all traits that kind of lend themselves to the people that load high onto agreeableness. Uh, empathy towards others is commonly understood as another form of agreeableness, even though there's a little bit of debate around that at the moment. Um, I can get to that later if you're interested. Uh, the opposite to agreeableness is obviously disagreeableness. Uh, it manifests uh, behaviour traits that are socially unpleasant, manipulation, nastiness towards others, a lack of caring or sympathy a lack of taking, in, uh, taking interest in others uh, and their problems are all quite common. Uh, agreeable people tend to find careers in areas where they can help the most, charity work, medicine, mental health, and even those who volunteer at like soup kitchens and dedicate uh, periods of their time to those sectors or and even the social studies areas and things like that people tend to be off the charts in terms of their agreeableness um, in terms of uh, business settings this is a bit of an FYI uh, 
low agreeableness can be good in certain situations. So think of times when you've gone for job interviews, where you've gone for promotions, where you've gone for renegotiations in salaries, for example. People who tend to be low in uh, agreeableness, they won't roll over. They just, if they think that they should be paying more or they deserve the promotion, they will stand up and state their case and justify those reasons. Where people who are high in agreeableness in those situations, they tend to really not speak their voice. Uh, they tend to get rolled over in those situations. So, like all the traits, there's, uh, there's pros and cons to having either high or low aspects of it. Um, where I have most of my concern where I, when I start to uh, clinically investigate people's personality traits if I think that there is some sort of um, treatment that needs to be made or if there's some sort of pathology that's creeping up, it's generally if someone is extremely high in something or extremely low and I'm talking uh, like the bottom 10% or the top 90%. Uh, so everywhere else, kind of in the middle between those, seems to be like the 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 zone to be per se. But if you're either too high or too low, then it can actually descend into into pathology. Uh, an example would be uh, conscientiousness. Um, so I my personally, I have to be careful because I, I rank in the 90th percentile uh, for for conscientiousness. But it means that. I'm, a tri I'm achievement striving, I'm goal orientated and I get things done, but I don't know how to switch off. Um, I have to be able to uh, hit the chill factor sometimes and just relax. So I'm really prone to burnout <laughs> syndrome, um, stress and anxiety disorders and, and, and stuff like that. So uh, this is why I want to get everyone to first do the test because it gives you a baseline measure. It gives you an understanding roughly of where you sit to begin with. And then from there, we can um, have further chats with either developing in terms of increasing or decre uh, decreasing the trait so that not only you become better traders, but just better kind of well-rounded individuals. Um, so you're not kind of delving into those areas of, of pathology and mental condition, uh, illness and things like that. So it's important to do, and it's it's, it's important to um, <clears throat> definitely talk about. So let's now talk a little bit about work and trading. We've already kind of started to provide some examples, but let's let's get into some more. So when hiring employees, for example, or testing the current ones, the big five traits, they help us to understand behavior in the workplace and it helps us to accurately predict, in many cases, future performance. And there's implications there for trading performance as well. It's not a, it's not a big leap to connect those two. So like I was saying, each personality type will have an impact within the working and trading environment. And being able to identify where there could be a positive or negative impact can help influence those decision making support systems so a candidate with high openness for example would would be willing to learn new skills and tools presented with more abstract problems they're more likely to think of abstract solutions to those problems and would be more focused on tackling new problems that were perhaps were previously overlooked so they can be quite useful there and we can kind of see that in trading outcomes as well um, there have been some interesting studies that show trait openness and a person's ability to think outside the box with creating uh, interesting and viable plays for themselves uh, where they might be making multiple trades at the same time for example um, we can talk more about that later uh, conscientiousness, I know that we spoke a ton of it, of, about it in, in the first session, but just a couple of points. Candidates with high conscientiousness scores wouldn't necessarily be sat at their desk until midnight every evening. Um, they would, however, be keen to get their work done, meet deadlines, and be a self-starter. They require little hand-holding to get the task done. 
So this is interesting because then conscientiousness has implications here for traders. So if you, it seems to be the case that if you can start to develop your conscientiousness, you don't have to rely as much on alpha, for example, because you're building those uh, adaptive competencies yourself uh, and you start to train and develop your skill sets by, by, by getting out there and finding information and analyzing certain things for yourself and making your own conclusions rather than having to rely on others. Uh, and that's one of the things that I'd really like uh, to tap into over the next few months is making sure that I'm doing my best to fortify everyone who's a PG holder in terms of their the way that they attack their, their trading and the decision support systems that they're utilizing um, through their day-to-day -day trades and things like that. Um, extroversion. So the ideal extroversion scores would depend on the role that uh, you're hiring for. Um, seen by many to obviously be leaders in the team, high extroversion would do well environments where they thrive off interaction with others, um, sales, marketing, PR, all that kind of stuff people facing skills the more technical job setups where specific focus or degree of isolation is needed is probably not a good person environment fit for extroversion in terms of trading it gets interesting because what we also see with people who are highly extroverted is they tend to get excited quite easily and sometimes they can let that excitement boil over and then it's all about making decisions based on emotion rather than logical and rational reasoning so let's say a hyped mint comes along uh, and it's not doing so well but then the hype's there through twitter and things like that a person who kind of is highly extroverted who's is giving in to the excitement on the day so to speak uh is probably going to pull the trigger when they shouldn't on, on the mint button or the buy button of secondary. So there's implications there for extroversion and uh, ideal trading outcomes as well. Next one, agreeableness. Those who show high agreeableness obviously suit those roles as we discussed before, the service of others. Of course, the opposite would be a negative type thing in, in, in team environments or, or not-for-profits because significance, there are uh, significant issues with regards to order of work towards common goals and tasks and things like that. And we've spoken about some of the trading implications for, for agreeableness as well and there um, let me just reiterate well, actually I'll, I'll 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 bring in another example so i've observed uh with certain people who are uh who are low in agreeableness meaning that they're disagreeable on a general basis tend to be a lot more skeptical and a lot more critical of projects coming through so they again they don't really give in to the hype they kind of look past that and then make their decision based on the facts of the project itself so they have that uncanny ability to see through the veil uh, and then uh, judge a project based on its merits so its team its track history its pedigree everything like that also those who are high in agreeableness not necessarily a good situation to be in especially if you are an active member on discords where you're talking to people and you get caught up in the moment everyone's minting and you just kind of jump on board with it uh it's those people that tend to be high in agreeableness will be the ones that kind of they don't really give themselves the chance for self-reflection and they don't think am i making a good decision here they kind of get caught up in the moment uh, and because they don't have those sub traits that a disagreeable person has they kind of either overlook those aspects behind the veil and they focus more on the veil that's kind of in front of them which is the hype and the, and the fomo and stuff like that um i'm not sure if g was able to uh hit the 
record button, but if it doesn't work, I'll just come back and re-record it. It's all good. Um, finally, neuroticism. Those that exhibit high neuroticism will not be suited to roles where there are consistent changes. Tasks that require song, a strong self-starting or, or, or autonomy or anything that is considered high stress. So probably not a good idea to be a full-time trader in Web3 during a bear market. Just saying. Uh, if you've got high, high levels of neuroticism. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible, but what I'm saying is based on the data, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be difficult for that individual. So as you can see, when we start to move through the big five, it doesn't really take long for us to start uh, to uh, reach out and, and see examples in the literature that show clear linkages between trading outcomes in each of these five traits. So these traits help us to understand how we're not going to, uh, how not just we're going to behave uh, in the moment, but also in the future. Uh, also, we spoke a little bit about the workplace and stuff like that. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll leave that information there for you to uh, soak up a little bit. And I'll throw a couple of more little facts at you. <clears throat> so here are some other studies that have looked at relationships between big five and and trading performance so we we all know about conscientiousness it's the top of the list um high conscientiousness uh, high conscientious individuals tend to be the best traders they're fiscally responsible they apply order and discretion they stick to trading goals so the buy sell marks that they set for themselves they Delay gratification, which is extremely important in the Web3 space because it acts as a mitigating agent against FOMO and hype, and they have the ability to control their impulses as well. So straight off the bat, there's like six or seven traits that fall under conscientiousness that are all great for, for traders. So the first point of call for anyone looking to become a better trader is to look at ways to increase conscientiousness <clears throat> openness is the next one it can be a double-edged sword as we found as people are now open to new projects taking a shot so it might pan out it might not so the true degen place so to speak uh extroversion depending on where you sit um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't in terms of taking chances. Um, more often than not, you probably want to tame down extroversion when it comes to trading. Uh, it seems to be the case that the introverted types, on average, tend to be better traders. Neuroticism, generally speaking, high neuroticism, big negative effects for trading performance. Um, just neuroticism in general for life outcomes in high doses is not ideal. Um, it's great for some situations, but they're very limited. Um, neuroticism is good if you want to play devil's advocate because you're quite skeptical. So I guess there is some positive points there for trading um, because you cast a more critical eye over the projects. You take your time when it comes to um, giving your due diligence, so to speak. Generally speaking, with agreeableness, the disagreeable people tend to earn more money than those who are agreeable. So there's that. Um, and most of that is given due to their relative insistence for the negotiation process. Um, oftentimes, those people who are disagreeable uh, will go find, fact find themselves. They don't tend to rely too much on other people for that stuff. Um, so there's a high level of autonomy that kind of comes along with that in terms of trading outcomes. Another thing I want to talk about is overtrading um, in bear or bull. So what does the evidence have to say on the relationships between overtrading and the big five? So what we found 
in studies was that overtrading was significant in rising markets compared to falling markets. FOMO, hype, overall market sentiment, all those sorts of things. That's a bit of a no-brainer, right? But conscientiousness can help mitigate some of those negative factors. Um, so during those times where it's particularly volatile, uh, that's where having that conscientious mindset, it, it really kind of um, earns its value, so to speak. Oh. What we also found in these situations is the degree of overtrading with investors who are, who are high in extroversion or agreeableness was more significant in rising markets. The degree of overtrading with investors in high conscientiousness was actually low in both bull and bear. And it's for those reasons we spoke about before, they're more fiscally responsible. So again, it seems to be the case that uh, they all play their part in some shape or form, but conscientiousness keeps coming out on top. So what do we also know about snap decisions? And what does the research say with regards to personality and making snap decisions? So we know that traders often have to think fast and make quick decisions, darting in and out of stocks or NFT, whatever it may be at short notice. So what we found that to accomplish this in a, in a kind of safe and fiscal, fiscally responsible manner, there needs to be a certain presence of mind. And that's where we start to talk talk about situation awareness, mindfulness, uh, having a presence of mind, uh, emotional intelligence. They also need the discipline to stick with their own trading plans and know when to book profits and losses. Emotions simply can't get in the way. And that's why I'm going to actually add another seminar to this course where we start to talk about stoicism because the stoics have this uncanny ability to be able to separate the decision-making process and have emotions on one side and then rational and logical thinking on the other. It's not something that you're not going to just pick up straight away. It's something that takes practice over time, right? But it's something that I want to actually set aside and have a separate uh, conversation about because I think stoicism is really important uh, for trading psychology. So what are those key takeaways from these last three or four bits? So overall center, uh, investor sentiment frequently drives the market performance in directions that are at odds with the fundamentals. The successful investor controls fear and greed, which are those two human emotions that drive that sentiment. And understanding this can give you the discipline and the objective, uh, objectivity needed to take advantage of uh, your emotions, but then other people's emotions as well, because oftentimes you're betting against other people in these conditions. So this is where high extroversion can be quite harmful, as getting carried away in the moment can be a very real thing for those individuals, especially if there's a combo of high extroversion, low conscientiousness. That's like danger zone for traders. Uh, but there are other uh, areas where high neuroticism might be useful. So what we found was uh, those high neuroticism tend to load on skepticism, which is always good for this space. The devil's advocate. Um, it slows the person down. It gets them thinking, it gets them critiquing, it gets them analysing more often. However, the problem with, uh, with too much neuroticism in this situation is that the person may actually never pull the trigger because they're constantly finding things to stop them, essentially talking themselves out of every trade where they just never kind of make them. And then they have uh, the reverse of buyer's remorse, essentially. Um, High openness can be disruptive here too, as high open people are generally more willing to take a chance on a new trade, particularly if they're low in conscientiousness. So that's another thing I want you guys to be thinking about. It's not just about thinking 
uh, about these traits individually in isolation. It's your overall combination of all five traits and how they uh, manifest and interact with one another. So as you can see, I'm just going to summarize quickly here. Each of these big five traits share multiple relationships with trading performance. Clearly, some are better than others, like conscientiousness. Some can act as barriers, like neuroticism. So it's about understanding where your baseline measures are on each of these and working from there to either increase or decrease that trait. So for those that didn't get a chance to conduct the personality questionnaire last week, uh, let's now give those people a time to take a shot at that. And for those that maybe did uh, do the test and you still have the results handy, maybe we can start to have a, a look at them where you can start to share some of your findings and we can start to uh, cultivate some ideas for improving certain traits and things like that. Ideally, I'd like to focus on conscientiousness, but... Um, I'm open to, to any and all questions on that. So what I'll do is I'll leave it there. And let's do some Q&A. So for those wondering uh, where the link for the personality test is, it's if you look up a little bit, it's the, the personal.psu.edu uh, link. I'll just post it again. Make sure you click accept on that transaction. Just joking. So when you click on that link, there will be the original IPIP Neo and then the short version. Through the short version, it's just as rigorous as the 300 item one, and it takes uh, less than half the time to do it. So take a shot at that one, the second link on that page. By the way, if you have Realm Hunter, it's uh, I think it's minting at the moment. Well, <laughs> Oh, it is. Their contract's broken. Project's still not test for this stuff. Come on. So funny because Joanna sent me, hey, funny say hi. I thought you text me.
I assume uh, everyone's doing the test. We don't have any questions popping up yet. Then she said, oh, this is the day I need. Demand is strong.
Do you agree with that result? So if, if, if you're wondering what gregariousness is, uh, gregariousness is described as a person that seeks and enjoys the company of others. Ordinal cubs, 2.3. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty low on extroversion as well. I don't think I was that low. Um, but yeah, I was, I was pretty low. Uh, I find uh, social outings to be quite draining. Like after about two hours, I've had enough, I'm done. Uh, I find that if I have a day where I'm doing multiple lectures, it's like a really long day for me. Because uh, I have to like turn on my extroversion to present to a, a lecture theatre full of students. Uh, and it ta really takes it out of me. Yeah, um, at, at, at primary and secondary school, definitely. At uni, not so much. Because, um, uh, you know, we, we treat them, we try and treat them like adults. If they don't want to turn up to class or hand stuff in on time, we're not going to chase them. Um, whereas at primary and secondary, they kind of have to do that. And it, yeah, if someone is uh, acting like a fool, we just kick them out as well. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I'd be able to handle being a teacher at primary or secondary school. Uh, university's a lot easier for like behaviour management and things like that. And it's one of the reasons why I like to teach, or I prefer to teach the postgraduate courses, the master students, because they're a lot older. Um, they understand the value in the dollar more. They understand that the course costs a lot, so they want to ask questions and they just listen more and focus more and interact more. Yeah, that's right. Yeah.
Where's your conscientiousness? Throw that up. So uh, have a look at your results, have a look at your scores and see where you land. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask. That's not bad. I've seen worse. And that's not even, it's not even a bad thing because conscientiousness can be developed, right? So you just have to show a willingness to do it. <clears throat> it's kind of like people when they, when they try and quit, quit smoking or drinking alcohol or, you know, cigarettes and stuff. Yeah. They have to have that willingness to do it first and then we can, we can help. Extroversion low, agreeableness average, conscientiousness high, neuroticism high, openness low. That's not a bad combo for trading. The only thing I'd probably mention that you would potentially want to work on would be neuroticism. Agreeableness 75, conscientiousness 86, neuroticism 4, openness 77. That's that's a good that's a good uh, trading framework right there. <laughs> Where's your extroversion? Okay, so you're kind of in the middle for that. So you could probably maybe work on your agreeableness. Uh, also openness. There's there's room for improvement there to reduce both of those. You don't want to increase conscientiousness. Um, that's fine where it's at. Your neuroticism's fine where it's at. Remember, we're only talking about trading here. Like in other facets of life, it's a different story. So just remember when we're, when we're talking about this, we're just talking about trading compositions. Told you, mate, you've got some room for improvement, which is always a good thing, right? <clears throat> There's only one way to go, and that's up. So conscientiousness could be improved. Neuroticism could be lowered. Uh, the others don't really matter at this point. But, yeah, conscientiousness I would, I, would, I would potentially work on, and neuroticism. I would, probably wouldn't do both at the same time. I'd probably tackle conscientiousness first. And then once you've improved that, then tackle neuroticism. So for conscientiousness, for example, to improve that, uh, it's going to sound weird, but it works. Um, and if you're already doing these things, we can get you other activities. But when I have someone come in and their life's like a complete mess and they're... <coughs> They lack order and, and things like that. I always get them to start at the, at the simple stuff first. So I get them making their bed, tidying their room, uh, and, and setting up their orderliness functions through those activities first. And I get them doing that for a couple of weeks every day without fail, without missing it, because it's all about consistency. You're essentially training your body and uh, your mind and aspects of your genetics um, 
so in order to do those things it needs to be habitual and for it to be habitual you have to do it for a minimum of 12 weeks but it's probably more like 14 to 16 weeks for it to become then automatic for those mean level changes of your personality trait to actually be different so this is where it gets really interesting with personality change so we've actually been able to uh, the epigenetic changes so epi in latin means on top of so you have the line of code that's responsible for say activation of conscientiousness which is that that line of code that's somewhere in your genome through your dna and through that consistent uh, practicing the proteins are actually uh, been um, changed and manipulated so the lines of code have actually been altered so it's a mutation on top of your genome that's increasing that mean trait of, of conscientiousness so it's working at the at the level of the genome here it's like it's deep deep stuff um, and we've been able to see that through um, electron microscope and all sorts of things where I don't know if I could find the video for you but it looks like this little miniature robot that's walking along your DNA and it's it's embedding its proteins in on top of the DNA and changing things around so anyway back to conscientiousness start cleaning your room and uh, making your bed in the morning do it every as soon as you wake up without fail and there's a reason why I highlight the notion that you should be doing it straight away before you even get up to go to the bathroom or get a drink of water or look at your phone is because it's all based around a biohack that I've found in the literature. So for, for, for us, making your bed is, is a pretty mundane thing. Like it's not like we're changing the world or anything like that. But at the neurochemical level, it's actually meaningful. So when you make your bed in the morning, you're actually sending a dopamine spike up your central nervous system. And the dopamine uh, neurotransmitter is like the feel-good uh, chemical, essentially. It gives you that positive hit of energy. It makes you feel good. So essentially what you're doing by making your bed in the morning is you're tricking your brain into thinking that it's already been productive for the day. It's doing something already and you've just woken up. And then if you start to do more tasks on that, so you make your bed, then you clean up your room, then you put on the washing, then you make yourself a healthy breakfast, then you have a shower and clean your teeth. So you do all that within like half an hour. You've done five or six relatively simple things that we should be all kind of doing anyway, but the body doesn't think like that. The body's thinking, Far out, man. You've been so productive. You've done these six things already. Here's six dopamine hits for you. Bam, 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 bam. And then what we've found in the research is, is that what uh, is usually enough to get people going for the rest of the day. So they move on to the next thing and then they move on to the next thing. Uh, then they get to work and then, you know, they're more productive there and it just keeps going kind of throughout the day. And what we found in the studies that if you set yourself up in the morning and do that stuff over a 16 week period you would have uh, built your conscientiousness to at least one standard deviation higher than what you started with and the effects are more dramatic based on the level of conscientiousness where you start at so if you're if you start at really low conscientiousness, like for example, where you are soldier with yours, you're at 16. I've seen lower, but yours is 16. It's still pretty low. The effects that you're going to have on conscientiousness is actually going to be a lot bigger than say someone that starts at say 40 or 50. So it's not necessarily a bad thing that you're starting at such a low at, at such a low starting point, you know what I mean? You'll catch up quick. Does that all make sense? <clears throat> uh, okay, so PC88, uh, software developer. 
mint everything, hold everything, struggle to sell. Oh, you're a hoarder. Kind of wanted to see the best in people and held bags to zero. Trade-wise, how can I improve that? Okay, so there's a few questions there, so let's tackle them one at a time. So the problem that you face with bag holding is an interesting one. And many, many people uh, suffer from that same fate. What makes it difficult is it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. So the reason why you're doing it might be different to, you know, the person next to you who's also has the same similar behaviours. So it's one of those situations where it requires kind of a tailored, curated approach for each individual to really dive deep and find out more aspects of the individual to try and drill down exactly why you're holding on to bags because it could be an altruism thing uh, it could be a sensitivity to guilt thing um, it could be a resource allocation thing which is heavily embedded in in evolutionary biology like it's a resource hoarding thing um, so it could be a number of those things uh, that are manifesting in you holding onto your bags so if you'd like, we could maybe set up uh, a consult for that later um, where we can do like a one-on-one -on -one where we can chat a bit more about it. Uh, what was the other question? What's the risk of high neuroticism? Uh, again, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, multiple things could be happening or any 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 one of uh, several instances so for example some people high neuroticism are extremely skeptical and critical which is a good thing i think in this space because then it means that they're taking their time to analyze projects uh, they're not giving in to the bs um, they kind of do the research themselves they don't really uh, take the project on face value they play devil's advocate they ask the questions and things like that so in some instances high neuroticism can actually be a good thing but what i have also observed with some traders high neuroticism is that they're so skeptical they never buy anything because they continually make excuses they continually critiquing like no project is ever perfect for them um and if that's the case that's a challenge um, particularly in high risk, high volatile markets like Web3, right? Uh, so again, uh, it might be something worth uh, diving a bit deeper to try and understand the, where it's coming from. Any more questions? Oh, I think, okay, so uh, pc is typing up another one by the looks. That's cool. If anyone else has any questions, fire away. I'm a crud. I forgot to scroll down. Uh, tried making the bed in the morning. The next day, kind of forgot. <laughs> yeah, bed. You got to be consistent. You got to do it every day for at least twelve weeks. So it could be that if if you if you're forgetting 
it's it's there's probably another underlying issue, right? Um, you might even be self sabotaging yourself. That that's a whole new kettle of fish, though, right? All right, PC88, sounds good, man. Good luck with moving the house moving. I do not envy you. I hate doing that. Extraversion 47, how do you tackle this? Um, you don't really need to. It's kind of in the middle, right? Um, you could lower it, I think, if you if you got it to maybe 20 points instead of 47 in terms of trading outcomes that would probably be a bit better for you but 47 is like smack bang in the middle you know it's not it's not the end of the world Yes, yeah, so remember that the, the test that you took does not factor in all the traits that fall under extroversion. So, for example, extroversion has uh, about a, a, at least 20 sub-traits, right? So the reason why they don't add all of them is because to do that test, it would take freaking forever, Um Plus, there's still debate over what ones exist in yeah, under which um, trait dimensions. So a lot of the ones you see there uh, are not necessarily... Well, activity level might be an interesting one. Excitement seeking is definitely linked to trading outcomes. Uh, gregariousness, potentially, in terms of social circles. Um, but then we'd have to look at some of your other traits as well. Uh, to see how they fare in terms of social ability, like openness to experience and things like that. Because what we found that people who tend to be high in gregariousness, because they're so social and they seek those social uh, interconnectivity, they might kind of fall prey to falling into the trap when everyone's degening into something and they'll jump into it with them just to be a part of that social environment at the time. So it could be that gregariousness uh, and activity level might be something that you could potentially look at to decrease in order to become a little bit more stable in trading outcomes. I'd have to dig into the literature to find activities for that. Okay, yeah, well, that kind of makes sense then, right? Whew. <laughs> Thank goodness. 15 years of trading, I'm glad I got it right. I'd look pretty silly if I didn't. So it in that instance, mindfulness is actually probably a nice uh, a nice theory to adopt. So when people are chatting, when the the chat's kind of firing, everyone's degening and, and getting on board and throwing up floor prices and and charts and everything like that. Pause for a moment and reflect. So before you hit that buy button, take a moment, take a big breath initiate your mindfulness and think about okay is this the right trade to be making and why am i about to hit this buy button am i doing it because maybe i got caught up in the moment a little bit and that moment of reflection might be the bit that you need to just rethink and it might end up being a good trade you know it's not always the case that you get caught up and it's always going to be a bad trade but that's where your situation awareness will come into play.
like we, a good example was actually this morning um, when I was in the Gen 1 chat um, going off on D-Labs. Uh, it was a 0.1. Floor went to 0.12. I told everyone to buy. Floor went to 0.22. Um, so that would have been an interesting moment to jump on board with that. <clears throat> Floor's back down to 1.5 at the moment. Most of the people have uh, have, have left. Questions have been answered. Maybe they've done the test and they're reflecting on it. Oh, I do actually have quite a few DMs. Yeah, I think most people are DMing me. Zero cool, man. Have you sat the test? You come late, you probably did. If you scroll up, there's a link there for your personality test. I reckon you'd be off the charts on extroversion. All right. Yeah, just kick me out when you need to, bro. No worries, man. Hope it helped. Uh, practice mindfulness in those situations. If you have any more questions, send me a send me a DM. I stop this thing. All right, guys. Um, I'll leave it there. Uh, I think everyone's kind of asked what they needed to ask. Um, if not, send through a DM. Um, I'll I'll leave it to uh, Zero Cool now. I think he's got an AMA starting soon. <laughs>